Welcome back. Today, we're going to be going over a pretty cool topic, one that may or may not be interesting to you, depending on where you are in your artist journey and what you've done. But today, I'd like to state the case that digital touring is not only around the corner, but will become the more attractive way to get live performance exposure to an audience in the coming five to 10 years, but maybe quicker, maybe two years. And if you're like, digital touring, that's boring, live stream, gross, uh, then you're probably the perfect candidate to stick around and watch this video. Let's get into it. Probably five years from now, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter, digital touring will not only be commonplace, but will be more attractive than regular touring. So let's start it off with the evidence against. When you hear something like digital touring, you might conjure up images of the COVID era, 2020 and 2021, when musicians tried all manner of silly, uh, ridiculous things in order to get in front of their audience since they couldn't tour. Live stream concerts pop up all over the place, including for comedians. They did live comedy through streaming. He criticizes the Chinese, but they got it right off the bat. <laughs> and the problem with that is that comedy relies on the reality action from the audience, and it's similar with music, right? It relies on the energy of the room. Uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we're never going to get digital touring because it doesn't replicate that feeling of being live. And I would agree, a major factor in digital touring being a thing is that it has to accurately replicate that feeling of being live. So that's a good mark against it, that, that, that we tried it out kind of in the COVID era and it wasn't too attractive. So let's file that away in the haven't we tried this before and it sucked column. Next up, VR still kind of sucks. VR is cool, it gets cooler every year, but it's still a, a far cry from this sort of fully immersive experience that, that we imagine when we think about virtual reality. You need to learn the way. The commander is I wanna here. die. Who assassinated the queen? Princess <laughs> The distance between perfect VR, what you imagine it should be like, and where we are now, is I would say greater than the distance between where we are now and where we were when I was like, you know, a teenager. I used VR back then in arcades and, and in demos and it wasn't, you know, too much worse than what we've got right now. So I would agree with you that VR still has a very long way to go and it doesn't seem like we're making very fast progress. On top of that, AR, augmented reality, where you overlay digital stuff on top of regular reality, that's not that great either. There are quite a few Pokemon appearing around here. So the tools that we would use to make digital live experiences real, they're still not very great. Which brings me to the last point that I think makes it easy to imagine why you would you would laugh at the idea of digital tours, which is metaverse. The tools we use to experience it aren't great, the venue we experience it in also isn't great yet. Hey, if you go you? on Horizon Worlds, which is Facebook's Hello? metaverse, like it's a joke. Funny hat. Thanks, dude. Funny oh, I accidentally, took, I accidentally took your hat. That was an accident. You know, any of the various crypto-related metaverses, they're not too great either. On top of that, I would say that you have this argument that, like, the, the real, real tangible, tangible human experience will never be replaced. So there's your, you sort of steel manning the argument that uh, that will never get digital touring, that it will never replace physical live shows, so it'll never be as good, and therefore we shouldn't worry about anytime soon digital tours replacing regular tours. Now let's get to the evidence for the stuff that I really want to say. To start off, I'd like to highlight the exorbitant and still rising cost of live touring. Touring has always been expensive, but it has become exponentially expensive in this modern era. Now that's due to a number of uh, transient factors, things that won't be the case forever. One being that oil became far more expensive. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that oil was negative dollars. Like you would get paid to accept physical delivery of oil. And then it skyrocketed to like, 
160 a barrel or something, which is technically an, an, an infinite percent increase. So that type of inflation occurring with the cost of oil means the cost of gas goes up, which means it's more expensive to fly a plane or drive a tour bus. We recently embarked on a massive United States tour supporting the band Whitechapel for 23 days. The total financial commitment before show one was 159,450 US dollars. Because of these pressures, the higher food costs, higher labor costs, higher oil costs, higher transportation costs, we saw over the last year, many musicians publicly give up on their tours. They either canceled tours that were about to happen, canceled tours that were in progress, or started dropping off a number of shows from their tour that were already planned, tickets were already sold. So we saw this mass burnout and mass exodus from touring due in part to the cost, but due also to mental health. Tons of artists coming out and saying, look, it's really sucks to tour. It's not fun after a while, and it takes a massive toll on your mental health to do so, and so I'm just gonna not do it. So yes, touring is expensive because of reasons that won't be here forever, but it's it's from a mental health perspective, it is expensive for reasons that will always be here. On top of that, touring is not very scalable as a product. There's only so many people in a given area and so many seats in a given venue in that area that you can sell. So there's a hard supply cap on the amount of tickets that you can sell. It's not an infinitely scalable product. And we live in the digital age where a lot of the most successful companies that you're competing with, they have an infinitely scalable product. As long as they can add another server to their server farm, they can, you know, fulfill thousands, tens of thousands more customers. Customers. So in an infinitely uh, expandable age, any product which doesn't have an infinite expansion is going to struggle to keep up with the rising tide. You cannot grow the supply and the demand increases, but the cost of fulfillment also increases. It's just not a good business model to, to be looking for a bright future in. So those are the reasons why I think physical touring is starting to show signs of major weakness, right? It doesn't doesn't seem like it's all you know sunshine and rainbows in the in the physical tour space. Look how pathetically fragile it is. Nothing this weak is meant to survive. So why would digital tours be the be the replacement for that? Well, we already saw some pretty successful digital touring or live performances during the COVID era that weren't nearly as cringe as the broad majority of ones that sucked. For one, Travis Scott's Fortnite performance was a, a spectacle, okay? So many people showed up for it. It was it was so widely viewed and it was cool because it was, it was taking advantage of the digital space, not sort of trying to replicate the physical space in digital, right? He flew in on a friggin' spaceship and, and all this cool stuff and he became 50 stories tall. Just things he can't do in meat space were accomplishable in Fortnite. And it made it cooler. It truly made it cooler than if he had done it live. So that's sort of, I think, the crack in the glass that you should pay attention to is that, wait a minute, you don't have to do digital touring like you do physical touring. And it's actually better if you take advantage of the ways in which it's not physical touring. Touring. On top of that, I would say that AR and VR being currently bad and, and not really having progressed that much is just to be expected to be expected from any information technology. I've spoken before on this channel that information technology, you can plot it on an exponential curve, right? And every technology within it is on its own exponential curve. So, you know, computer games from 1990 to 2000, not that dramatic a difference. Computer games from 2000 to 2010, a lot more dramatic. From 2010 to, to now, 2023, it's wild what we've accomplished. So every, you know, every Every year, the, the rate of progression intensifies. So I think with players like Apple getting into augmented reality, Facebook to having this huge development budget for not only virtual reality, but metaverse, I think you'd be a fool to bet against it drastically improving over the next 10 years, like unimaginably so. I think within five to 10 years, we're gonna have fully immersive virtual reality. I think that augmented reality will shrink to the size of a, of a contact lens, something you can put in your eye instead of over your eyes. I think these things are going to aggressively accelerate in their quality and fidelity. So we've got the, the rising infeasibility of physical tours, the costs, the, the hard supply cap, the fact 
fact that it's not scalable. You have already some digital experiences being cooler in their own way than physical experiences having to do with live concerts. Then you have the aggressive development budgets behind augmented reality, virtual reality, and metaverse technologies, right? Things, things that are going to come to bear over the next five to 10 years and, and won't seem as laughable as they do now. If you think it's ridiculous, you gotta dial back the clock and think about how ridiculous in the 1990s it seemed to have a fully online business. It's super normal for us now to think about a fully online business, a business that exists entirely online. But back then, it seemed like you you were crazy if you think that's going to happen. You have to remember we were playing Oregon Trail, logging on to AOL. The internet did not have, you know, a, a tenth of the capacity and, and capability that it does now. Who says online users are a bunch of anti-social geeks? So if you came to someone and you said, look, in about 10 years, every single part of the chain in a business will be done online. Hiring will be done online. The work will be done online. The product will be an online product. People will consume it online. They will buy it online. If they need customer support, they're going to do that online. You, you would be looked at like you're insane. From where we stood in 1995, it seemed like that would never ever happen. There's gonna be at least a major component, if not all the components of a business need to be run physically. But sure enough, computers got faster, we got better webcams, we got you know higher bandwidth so we could you know very rapidly transmit video across the internet. We got same day shipping, we got payment gateways online working pretty seamlessly. All your credit cards went online. A lot of your media consumption went online. So a lot of things had to happen for it to get there. And it would have seemed ridiculous if you said it 10 years before it actually became a thing. But sure enough, it became a thing. And just like it was ridiculous in 1995 to say the entire business chain will be online. It similarly seems ridiculous now to say that all of the live experience stuff is just going to be online. But I, th I think it's coming. I think it's gonna happen. I also think that it needs to happen because the incumbents in this uh, physical touring space, they suck. Ticketmaster, Live Nation, they're just terrible, rapacious, uh, greedy, just awful businesses. They, they work almost entirely through force. They signed contracts with all of these major venues and locked them out from booking any non-Live Nation acts. Their protocols for taking payment, for ticketing, they're all super antiquated. They're all based entirely on them extracting maximal value from the customer and from the artists. They suck. They suck, 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 suck. They're not good. But they have these long draconian contracts with all of these venues. How are we going to get around that? We probably won't. We have to wait for those contracts to expire. And in the meantime, you have artists coming up against this problem, you know, day in and day out. Just like, you know, we didn't actually defeat the major record labels of the 90s. We just made a better alternative through decentralization in the internet. So too, I think that will happen with physical touring. And I don't think it will take long. You know, I, I, I give five to 10 years to be conservative. I think we could see it in the next three years. I think digital tours are around the corner, but I'd love to know what you think. What are your arguments against this? Why, why don't you think this will happen? Or if you do, what are some things I might have missed that, that give great arguments for it happening in the near future? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to learn more about your opinion on this because I haven't talked to a whole lot of people about it. And if you like this video and would like to see more videos about the music industry and internet technologies and future tech and stuff like that, then give us a, a subscribe, ring the bell to get notified and give us a like. I'll see you guys in the comments. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week with another video. Peace out.